recording. <clears throat> I'm clear my throat for the beginning of the record. Okay, there we oh, go. You know what? I didn't get any water. Well, should I wing it or should I go get some water? You can go get some water. This is not the proper show yet. All right, I'm going to go get some water. I'm going to go get some water. Uh, oh, no, I have to riff. Do I have to riff by myself? See, that's why I shouldn't. I should have said no. That's what I should have done. Oh, well. Uh, looking for stars. We went to the planetarium, but they didn't do the planetarium part. They just did the projection show of a dinosaur thing, and they never showed us the stars, which was a bummer, because we actually went there to do the stars. Okay, I can stop riffing now. Okay, I'm <clears throat> Oh, okay. Get cool. all the squeaks out of my chair, also. Oh, I don't think the squeaks are ever coming out of my chair. The nice thing oh. about maybe the nice thing about Zoom is it cuts out a lot of the background noise. Okay. Which well, good because nice. I feel like I'm squeaking and I'm always trying to be really still and not like rustle papers and pencils and. Because I'm always concerned if I turn the fan on. Like I just turned the fan on. Do, do you even notice a difference? Uh, not at all. Okay. See, you can hear it through the mic because the mic picks up everything, but Zoom. Uh, filters a bunch out. Mm. Mm. I'm coffee today. I hope I don't do that to the podcast. <laughs> okay. Uh, sure. Why don't we just jump into it then? Because now okay. I have to go to another planetarium for reasons I explained while you were getting water. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Time Enough Podcast. It's where we delve into all of the episodes of the Twilight Zone and beyond. As always, this is Matt here, coming back. It's Dorian. Howdy. How's it? You know what? Last time I said ahoy because we had a ship-themed one. This time I'm going to say hello and riders up because we have a jockey theme. Oh, I thought you'd be like, hello! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Give it more oh. like a, a a Mickey Rooney punch. Um, yeah, I invited you to this one because I'm like, I need someone who's properly obsessed with Mickey Rooney for the last night of a jockey since he's the... Mm -hmm only dude in this episode so um yep. I, I guess i guess i'll let you lay out although after i did our, our mutual friend mark i did message him i was like if i knew how much he was shouting in the episode and on the commentary <laughs> track i would have yeah. uh maybe invited him but oh well <laughs> yeah i don't know if you're keeping like a sweaty meter but like the sweating and the yelling started really early with this one and it's kind of a one-man show but it's a two-character show so i really liked it this was a fun episode uh, we'll get to that. I mean, I, I kind of agree with you. Um, but I when I was looking through things about this episode, a lot of people do not think this episode is fun. So <laughs> really? Why not? Uh maybe too dark, too claustrophobic for them. I don't know. Um, mm. I gave it two viewings and because the second time I, I had to play the commentary track, which we will talk about a little bit later. Put a pin in that for sure. Um, uh, but yeah, I was like, I actually did kind of like it better the second time. So that's always a good you know, sign for something. So you know the answer to this and I don't, but now we're back at a half hour. So it went back and forth. Yeah, the fourth season was a full hour uh, because Twilight Zone had to take over its old slot plus the show that followed its slot. But by the following, it was a mid-season replacement. By the following year, though, they it was just, you know, there were new shows and they could just slot it where it belonged, basically. So Got it, got it. Okay. So the, the weird okay. experiment's over, but... um. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm thinking about what order I should do things in today. Well, go go ahead and lay out your your Mickey Rooney ground. How does he fit into your uh, film geekery? Oh well, I mean, he. It's hard to appreciate now how big of a star Mickey Rooney was in like the late 30s and the early 40s, and what an asset he was to MGM. So that's kind of what my expertise is is MGM. So he's like smack in the middle of all the stories and all the action and all the films and. Um, so you had a bio. Do you want to read your bio? And then I can, I don't know. Do you want to do the episode first or the bio? Because there's really so much to say about him that we should choose one path because I guess Lord could be a free for all, whatever you'd like. Okay. I guess that means we should probably just go ahead and do the uh, preliminaries. Um, okay. So I will go ahead and do my trivia. Well, let's see. There's not too much because there's only one actor, right? Actually, well, yeah, um, but there's a lot of trivia about Mickey Rooney. <laughs> there is. I, I started looking at trivia about the set, too, right? And that's where, um, well, first I just saw on my DVD commentary by Mickey Rooney. I'm like, what? So I had to play <laughs> that. And then I was, uh, I found out that it's kind of a notorious track um, because I was trying to find trivia about, like, the set because, you know, they change it, the size thing, right? And I couldn't mm -hmm. find anything on that. And Rooney certainly didn't help. But uh, I mean, anyway. it's at MGM. That's what I know. Like, many of the episodes have shot yeah. at MGM. 
Anyway, here's our trivia. The original air date was October 25th, 1963. Script is by Rod Serling, who wrote it with our star in mind. Joseph M. Newman directed. As mentioned before, he's new to the zone in season five, but is pretty much the season's pinch hitter. Mm, that was the wrong sport to reference. Oh, well. <laughs> I mean, I can't make a, you know, horse racing reference anyway. Polo, what, what, it's not polo. Polo is different. See, I don't know what I'm talking about. Polo is different, yeah. That's that's why we have Disneyland now, right? <laughs> to have familiar? all the sports. Walt Disney, when he was trying to become more ingratiated with the Hollywood crowd, joined a polo club to, you know, oh, meet more heads. Yeah. And, and then had a, mm -hmm. had a polo injury, so he had to get mm -hmm. a new hobby, which turned out to be trains, and he needed a place to put his trains, and that eventually turns into Disneyland. No, a lot of people liked polo and a lot of the studio heads did not. So many of their top stars like Spencer Tracy were told, like, don't be doing polo because it's it is such a dangerous sport. So it was a liability for them. So, yes, that was that was the polo scene, but it was very popular. I mean, kind of yes. how it still is in England with like the royals and such. Look what happened to Walt Disney. There you go. Playing with his trains <laughs> now. <laughs> Um, yeah, let's uh, finish off the trivia. And and again, this is horse racing, not polo. Slightly different, very different. Maybe I don't know. I'm not. I'm not a sports guy. We can go over it. I'm from the from horse country. So. There we go. Grady is played by the Roonster himself, Mickey Rooney, a, a little Hollywood legend. He child starred through the 30s to becoming the top draw on the silver screen alongside regular co-star Judy Garland by 1939. Mm -hmm. Boys Towns, Boys Town, Babes in Arms, and those Andy Hardy films, just to throw out a few. He served 21 months in World War I and found himself a bit short to be an adult star at only five feet tall. Though no longer a power player, he continued to work in film and eventually television while also running game as one of Hollywood's greatest stickmen. Eight Wives. Ava Gardner. Will not mention Breakfast at Tiffany's. And of course, he had a restaurant. No, it's not the potato fantasy fake that went viral a few years back. It is Mickey Rooney's Weenie World, which is at least as amusing as a potato fantasy. <laughs> I missed that fact somewhere. I was, <laughs> I, I'm glad that you found that. Well, I heard people talking about the potato fantasy. I think that was on podcast The Ride. And then they dug a little deeper and like, oh, here's a real one. Right. So <laughs> which is just as weird. Um I do not know if uh, you have the prologue because I didn't tell you to do that, but it's well, Do you want me to supplement your trivia or jump to the prologue? Let's do the prologue first because we can just do some general Rooney talk. Um, okay. Let's see. Prologue. I know I've got it. Let me get it. Wait, I closed it. Hold on one sec. It's fine. I edited this part out because I can spot the silences. Okay, good. <laughs> Let me see. Where did you go? Okay, got it. I have everything else pulled up, but I forgot that one. Okay, <laughs> I have it. I'm ready. I'm ready when you are, or I guess I'm ready when I am. Ready? Mm. Good to go? Yes, yes. Okay. The name is Grady, five feet short in stockings and boots, a slightly distorted offshoot of a good breed of humans who race horses. He happens to be one of the rotten apples, bruised and yet and yellow. Oh, damn it. Will you please cut this one out? Because last time you didn't. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Just start over. Silence. I'm going to start over, but don't include that. <laughs> okay. The name is Grady, five feet short in stockings and boots, a slightly distorted offshoot of a good breed of humans who race horses. He happens to be one of the rotten apples, bruised and yellowed by dealing in dirt, a short man with a short memory who's forgotten that he's worked for the sport of kings and helped turn it into a cesspool used and misused by the two-legged animals who've hung around sporting events since the days of the Coliseum. So this is Grady on his last night as a jockey. Behind him are Hialeah, Hollywood Park, and Saratoga. Rounding the far turn and coming up fast on the rail is the Twilight Zone. All right. All right. I guess I should ask you about some of that um, horse race and stuff uh since you said you were from horse country because i was thinking when you said that oh um uh, my aunt's family was lived in maryland for a while and i, I believe my cousins had horses growing up mm -hmm. older than me they're like 10 years older than me but uh yeah they had some horses and uh then they moved to maine i think that's when i visited them as a kid and they were riding me around on a pony so 
There's people That's in my awesome. family that certainly know this stuff, but I <laughs> don't. So uh, what, what, so, what yes. is horse country? Horse country, well, I mean, Maryland is where I was born and raised, and that is horse country. We have the second leg of the Triple Crown there. We have the Preakness, which is Pimlico, um, and jousting is our state sport. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I, I just know that in my family that equestrians, it was a multi-generational thing. So my grandmother, my mother, I was riding before I have memories of riding. Um, so I rode for a good, like, dozen years, and then I have on and off since. Um, but Maryland is just a big, big horse country, lots of farms, lots of horses, lots of appreciation for all the things. Um, and, you know, I looked up sport of kings because I thought that was fox hunting or jousting, but it does say horse racing. So it looks like there are a couple of sport of kings, but because it relates to the horse, that's kind of where we're getting that. So the kings so like it fun. because it's more exciting than fox hunting, but less dangerous than jousting. Fox hunting, if you weren't chasing and killing a fox is really fun. You're running through the forest, you know, you're all like going in one place. Like that's a really thrilling and dangerous. Every single time you're on a horse is dangerous. So there's that too. And I mean, this this episode touches on horse doping, which is still unfortunately problematic, like a, a pervasive thing, even at the very top level. So it's, I love horses. So it's sometimes hard to love the sport that uses horses. You know, if it's a clean thing and it's a, it's a race that's, you know, exciting and requires skill, then that's all great. But unfortunately, the reality is that a lot of these things are are more dangerous for a person and animal. So I don't know, it's kind of a downturn on, on the love of horses. But so it was a good episode for me because and also I want to say now that Mickey Rooney actually was an animal rights activist. So he would never be doping horses. <laughs> um, and also that he played a jockey on many things. So I've got a recommendation to give at the end and that involves jockey. And as early as National Velvet in 1944, he, I guess it was the hype thing, but he played a jockey a lot. So this is sort of smack in the middle and it's a perfect, I can see why it was written for him. I should start just like <laughs> dropping in little bits of the commentary as, as we go. <laughs> Let's Please do, because you listened and I did not, so okay. I'll be <laughs> amused. So I, I, do you know when it was, though? When when was the commentary track shot? I'm going to guess he was probably, like, already in his 90s when uh, for this. <laughs> okay. Because the set came out 2012. I'm, it, you, it doesn't, you don't know who the interviewer is, but I'm guessing it's, uh, was it Mark Scott Zickery, the, the guy who wrote the, the book on the Twilight Zone quite literally? I'm guessing he's doing the interview, but uh, okay. he's saying things like, what today's audience doesn't understand is that for years, whenever anyone mentioned something about a jockey and being short, you were the butt of all those jokes. I'm proud of that. Is his <laughs> response. Yeah. <laughs> and then nobody talks for about five seconds after that. <laughs> I mean, I mean, to ask him if he like remembers the shoot, I don't know. I guess there should have been a conversation before he signed up for it. But if you're <laughs> if it's 2012 and you're trying to ask being asked to remember something from 19. Oh, also, we could throw in now that Mickey Rooney's career spanned the silence to the digital age. On IMDb, there is a credit from 2021. That's a 95-year span. So asking him to remember one thing that he did in the 60s, like I can, in his defense, that's kind of a long time, you know, to ask a specific question about a specific thing. But you listened to it and you said off the rails. So I also trust your judgment. <laughs> well, to, to quote the, uh, what was going on with you when you made this? I don't remember. It was too long ago. <laughs> Sorry, I, the tone of voice is important for the commentary, of course, because he just yes. sounds like he would like to be anywhere but there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> the only time he sounds kind of happy there is right at the beginning. He's like, hi, Mickey Rooney, you're watching the Twilight Zone. And then, and then <laughs> after that, it just all goes downhill. So maybe they should have left it at that. <laughs> but um, also in his defense, over the years, he has been he was very vocal about what it was like to work for the studio system, what it was like to be at MGM, and what Judy Garland was like, and what it was like when the day Harlow died. Like, there, there are so many things that he's helped contribute. So it's disappointing to hear that this was not particularly insightful. But, you know, he, overall, he, he spoke a lot about a time that historians now are very grateful to have those little insights into the time and place. So I wanted to make sure that I, I shared appreciation on that level, too. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess for his career, I'm not that, sorry, one more edit point, but do you happen to have a uh, headphones or earbuds anywhere by chance? No. Am I echoing? I'm echoing, actually. 
like so, coming through yours and uh then every once in a while it's not like like now it's not doing it so i don't know i, I maybe zoom filters just like screw it up sometimes or maybe like it's that. because i'm not like facing forward because i like trailed off so let me try is this better it's fine right now yeah so okay I don't... so i need to just sit still i knew it <laughs> oh <laughs> okay. i guess you do need to sit still then um yeah okay i'll i'll do that okay give it two seconds of silence and i'll i'll go with what i was about to say Yeah, I'm looking through his filmography here, and I guess I don't... Oh, I, I saw him in The Muppets, didn't I? I mean, I saw him in more recent stuff, but I definitely... If I think Mickey Rooney, I'm thinking the the young guy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, anything else? Not, I've never seen Night in the Museum. He's in that. Okay, that's interesting. Yes, uh, the sequel... Like, he did the sequel, like, a couple weeks before he died. Like, he, it was all the way up to the end. Um, so, yeah, the, the first one was 2006, and the second one was... 2014 and that was actually after robin williams died too so i believe the film's dedicated to both of them of course we remember him in the simpsons uh there's that <laughs> uh <laughs> ooh, silent night deadly night five the toy maker what's he doing in that i'm not watching that movie whatever <laughs> he's doing he's taking forty thousand dollars for a day's work or more actually <laughs> we could probably get more than that <laughs> Eh, maybe for that movie, you know, I don't know. Oh, he's in Back to Oz as the voice of the Scarecrow. That's that's kind of disturbing. That, we oh, could touch on his Oscar <laughs> nomination. That is night. That is 1972's Journey Back to Oz, not 1985's Return to Oz. I got confused. Not in wheelie territory. Evil Roy Slade. I remember my high school um, photography teacher like trying to play that was like the best movie ever to us i mean i think we did watch it and it was you know okay <laughs> <laughs> kind of dumb it's a, it's one of those you know like western comedies they did in the late 60s early 70s um mm -hmm. and, and then they made blazing saddles and there was no reason to make an, one of those ever again you know mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah okay uh, it's a mad 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 world i know that movie never actually mm -hmm. bothered to watch it you know uh <laughs> I've actually never watched Breakfast at Tiffany's, to be honest. But then they go back to the, you know, the the boys' town and stuff. And I've seen that stuff. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've just seen I've just seen his uh his his actual I guess A list stuff. Well, his four nominations. So he received two Oscars, and then he had four nominations for other things. So the first thing he got was a Juvenile Academy Award, which took me down a rabbit hole about that. That only existed from 1934 to 1960, and only 12 people ever got them. There's a very handy chart on. Uh, Wikipedia to reference, but that was for the performance in Boys Town. So he got that then. And then he had a uh, Best Actor nomination for Babes in Arms, 1940. Best Actor nomination, The Human Comedy, 44. Then, and this is what I haven't seen, The Bold and the Brave, a Best Supporting Actor nomination in 1957. And then, of course, The Black Stallion, which I will be talking about, and that is Best Supporting Actor in 1980. And these are all the year, sorry, these are the nomination years so it's the year after the film you know how they like gets confusing but roughly those are the and then a lifetime achievement oscar in 1983 so that's interesting to have two oscars but be nominated for four totally separate things because of these honorary ones so and he also he has four stars on the walk of fame and i didn't even know that was possible so it's not just film radio television but also live theater so that's four four whole stars four different stars yeah i guess that makes you a goat yeah <laughs> but uh how, how do you feel about his performance in this one it is you know like a solo performance i mean like you said there's technically two characters although it's the same character right so uh no I, it's different it's different characters but the same person right 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 so uh i don't know how, how do you rate his acting for this episode i guess is what i'm getting at <laughs> I like the range. I like. I can see why some people might feel as claustrophobic, but I kind of liked how they utilized that space. I mean, they were up, down, around every reflective surface. I love the part where he's stomping on the mirror and we see it from the mirror's perspective, you know, like, you know, it starts sweaty and yelly, but I, I don't know. I think it's a really fun ride and it, um, it, it I don't know. I, I liked it a lot. I thought that it was a good use of him and I can see how it was written specifically for him and it had a great pace. Yeah, I, I did love it when he tries to destroy a plaque because it's the last reflective surface in his room. 
Oh, and that cackle in the beginning, like his overhead cackle when the voice, when the voice starts first appears and he just, it's the same scary cackle over and over while he's like trying to get his bearings about why he's hearing this voice. That was super sinister. <laughs> so um, I, this is a good time to read what he said on the commentary track about his acting in this with the interviewer saying, what kind of preparation do you do? Nothing. That's it. There's no preparation <laughs> for things like this. You just do them. Yeah. You know, it's something when you do one of these things all by yourself and when there's nobody with you. It's interesting. It's interesting to watch. I hope everyone will enjoy. Did the director give you any? No, nothing. You just played the scenes. Watching <laughs> this, would you have done anything different? No, you play them for what they're worth at the moment you're doing them. Uh, these, <laughs> these questions being interrupted with the answers in a gruff voice. So I'm honest. I feel like I'm doing a little more Ed Asner than I'm actually. I think Rooney's in the same space when he's angry, I guess, as a as an Ed Asner. <laughs> I guess, but also he was intense. Like he was a high energy dude. Like I don't know. It, it just this all makes sense. Like if you if I just read these and these words and I didn't see or hear like the reaction coming from him, like that all is pretty logical stuff. I mean, he's he's been doing this since he was six. You know, I mean, imagine like, yeah, you and it was written specifically for him. So it kind of makes sense that he just showed up and did the work and like read the lines, <laughs> wet a bit and left. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it, it's too bad. Tom Cruise has already recorded all of his commentary tracks because I, I bet we get the same thing if we had a 90 year old Tom Cruise talking about his old movies or something. <laughs> 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 I'm just thinking think of short, intense stars, you know, that started off young. Oh, okay. He didn't start off six young. I think he started off like at 18 or whatever. But the first, can I, can <laughs> I put my one short joke in here? It's not mine, but the first thing, the first time I was aware of Mickey Rooney, it was through a joke that I heard on television. And it, somebody said, yeah, right. And Mickey Rooney's not short. He's just four blocks away. And that was my first introduction to who Mickey Rooney was. And I eventually learned a lot more, but like that is such a pervasive thing. Like how how annoying to deal with that your whole life. Like I, really I either have a good answer or a bad answer. It was either me picking videos off of my aunt's shelf in Delaware as a kid. And you know, that's that's how I stumbled into picking up Thin Man movies and Marx Brothers movies mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, or Mad Magazine. Mad Magazine might have also done it. I might have just picked oh. up a reference in Mad Magazine. I do know when he showed up on The Simpsons, I already knew who he was by that point. So. <laughs> and I've never <laughs> seen The Simpsons one. I can't remember which one he's in right now, but I do remember he's in one. I, I think that's where the runester comes from. <laughs> <laughs> the Brunster. Well, also his name was Joel Yule and Junior. He was a junior. His dad is also taken care of by MGM. He was in. Okay, let me let me let me veer off to the side here. So Joel Yule Junior was Mickey's name. He did the series of Silence, and the character's name was Mickey. So eventually, he evolved from his name to taking the stage name of Mickey Rooney. And then the thing about his dad was that MGM, when Mickey was a star, then took care of his dad and made sure his dad played. He had he had like 72 roles, but none of them, some of them, okay, they were predominantly uncredited. But from 1936 to 1950, like MGM made sure that his dad was employed and was, you know, that's kind of how they took care of people they cared about. So um, that was my fact about him and his name and his dad. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, I I guess the studio system is cool for some people, right? Like honestly, if I if I were an actor, I think I'd probably prefer the Hollywood system, studio system where it's like, "Hey, I'm getting a paycheck. I don't need to like wait be on the gig economy, you know?" Yeah, I wonder kind of like how I thought there might be a silent movie that got an Oscar again and then eventually the artist did. I'm going to say go ahead and say that I wonder if there will be a restructuring one day where people Sort of adapt the modified version of the studio system because there are a lot of things you can accomplish when you're sort of all working together but it was the the limited freedom that people had in the roles that they chose like that was the biggest flaw of the studio was that if they found a formula then they just kept going with it and people artists were frustrated with that but behind the scenes all those people doing costumes and makeup and Dressing and directing like they had a, a, a spectrum of experiences so I don't know I do wonder if sometimes sometimes if if too much independence will then recollapse into a studio structure sometime in the future 
Well, that's the streaming system now, isn't it? You make a movie or TV show, they put in a vault and write it off for tax breaks and nobody gets to see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is that is an evolution for sure. Or you put out a great movie and it gets Netflixed, which in 2016 might have been a good thing. But now if your movie gets Netflixed, uh, maybe five people are going to watch it, even if it's a great movie, you know? <laughs> I guess it's hard to, it, there's so much content now. It's sort of like the internet. Like there's so much information that our, our biggest problem is sort of organizing and accessing. So. I mean, yesterday I was at the, the used store and I, I found a season one, of Legion on, on Blu-ray. And it's like, Oh, someone six years ago recommended this, like to that. I'd love it. And I'm like, I almost bought it, but I was like, man, I don't even have time to watch this. So if it's here next time, I'll get it. That's kind of. Is that the doubt. AMC one with, with the Dan guy from, uh, is, uh, it's a Marvel thing, right? Yeah. Is yeah. The X-Men okay. thing. Yeah. It, it said FX actually on the packaging. So I think it was an FX thing, but oh, I don't okay. know. I don't, do tv stations i live in japan i mean i don't do american tv stations at least <laughs> you have pal there like or, is that the format of your stuff uh no, you're a different region no we, we were the same vhs region different okay. dvd region so you can't play a japanese dvd in an american player but okay. same blu-ray region so oh blu-ray's never a problem okay uh mm -hmm. the only time it was a problem i, I bought one at uh, actually the same used store i got the founder and it it turned out for some reason they're actually selling like the, the the British version, which is a different region in Blu-ray. So that was annoying. <laughs> I'd take it back. I'm about to get a region free Blu-ray player or DVD player so I can watch all the things because that's going to open up so much. <laughs> You'll be able to watch all of Rooney's movies, including the ones you've missed. Um, mm -hmm. you you said you wanted to give a special shout out to the the style, the Return of the Stallion, 1980. Am I getting it right? Mm -mm. The Black Stallion, 1979, the first one. Okay, because, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, as a, a that wouldn't have got my attention growing up for reasons, and for reasons it absolutely got your attention. So uh, why don't you go on, on that little little tangent? Well, I mean, I loved horses as a kid, so, but this is a beautiful film for anyone, and Mickey Rooney is great in this. So it's about a boy and a horse who are stranded on an island. They come back and they sort of reintegrate into society, and the horse is um, kind of, something no one else has seen and so Mickey Rooney plays a former jockey who is like that is a fast horse and like you know suggests to the boy and his mom played by Terry Garr like you should really think about maybe racing this horse but the only person who can ride that horse is this kid so Mickey Rooney mentors him and how to become a jockey and then it all culminates in like a racing thing and of course this horse is just bewildered by this environment and it's exciting and it's beautiful and it is definitely something to watch he make your has a great performance but the whole film is strong and, and wonderful and memorable so it is based on a, a book um so that is definitely my my older rooney recommendation and then later i have an early one that's a little bit deeper of a cut if you want to see him as a kid so i will i will have that for later Okay. As we were getting rolling, you were saying, oh, this episode is fun, which which I I mean, I like I like the genre of Crazy Man Scream. So, yeah, that's fine. But this is not necessarily, it seems, a loved episode. I, I just took a yeah. page out of my other podcast and went to the uh, IMDb reviews, which there are some eight and tens here, but there's also ones with saddled with a dull script. The dullest 25 minutes in the entire dimension of sound, sight and mind. Bore that's pretty fest. mean. Bore fest. <laughs> uh, let's see. Doll reworking of Nervous Man in a Four Dollar Room. Are you familiar with Nervous Man in a Four Dollar Room? Have you seen that episode any time in the ever? <laughs> does it have Burgess Meredith in it? It does not. This is another one that is a uh, mostly a one man show. Uh, one other guy comes in, so it's actually a two man show. Uh, Last Night of the Jockey is the most minimal Twilight Zone with one actor, but. Uh, Nervous Man in a Four Dollar Room has two, I think, maybe three. Ringing a bell, but I can't remember who was in it, so I'm not accessing it. Okay. Um. Yeah. I mean, there there are a lot of similarities. He's talking to himself in a mirror. That's that sort of thing. Or he's talking to his alter ego in a mirror. Uh. It's mm -hmm. the, this is the Twilight Zone. Um. Repeating itself for better or for worse. You you could, but I think this one's at least a contender for, you know, maybe it's 
it ranks up against its predecessor. Uh, we did I Dream a Genie, and we were like, oh, God, we've already done Message in a Bottle. And that one was okay, and uh, I Dream a Genie was just like, Bleh, you know? <laughs> I actually wrote a quote down because I really liked it. When he talks about, you know, when he asked his reflection, like, who are you, basically? And his reflection, I love these lines. I wrote them down because I thought the writing was fun. He said, I'm the fate every man makes for himself. I'm the strength dredged up in desperation. I'm the last gasp. I'm sorry, that's fun. That's fun writing. <laughs> like that is a great confrontation between a person and his psyche. Like I, I love that kind of stuff. So I don't know who who, who am I to say, but I really did like it. And I, I like that that inner struggle. And it's kind of reminded me of an Aesop fable. Like it's simple and the, the twist is there and the irony is heavy and it's just simple. But I love that about it. It's minimal and but this man's destroyed in the course of 25 minutes. Like and you know, I wanted to ask, like, the part where he gets the phone call and they say, oh, we want you back. Like, they've taken, there's a petition to get you back. Like, I, I thought about that later. And I was like, so this whole time when he talks about wanting to be a big man because he cares about how other people think, it's that's sort of the most ironic part is that he was so beloved. But unless the psyche guy is really a demon and making all this up. But, you know, my understanding is that truly the people wanted him back and they were willing to overlook this, you know, egregious doping and, you know, getting thrown out of the whole sport. But that's kind of the, the final nail in of pain that they wanted him back and he wasn't aware that they people cared about him so much because he wanted to, you know, I like that. I thought that was that was another little detail that came back later. And why is he so much like bigger is better? I mean, if I woke up and I was eight feet tall, I, I don't think I'd be happy. I mean, he should be wishing for like a six foot. He doesn't want to be a he doesn't <laughs> he want doesn't, to be a freak, does he? <laughs> no, it wasn't about the height at all. It was about, you know, you know, you're just joking. Cause like it was about him being important, not about yeah. literally big. No, I know that. that. It's just but li he's literally becoming big and he seems happy with it. He calls this girl, he's like, guess what? I must be like eight or nine feet tall now. Which <laughs> uh, you're on the phone too. You sound crazy when this is not a when this conversation has no visual component, you know? He's if, ten feet tall, apparently. He goes from five to ten. So he's oh, he goes tall. he goes five, eight to ten. If you notice at the end he goes an, an, an extra two feet that's when he his head starts hitting the ceiling oh i didn't really mickey see rooney got confused mickey rooney got confused <laughs> by it too in the commentary because when he first gets eight feet he's like oh i'm gonna bump my head into the ceiling and then that doesn't happen for another 10 minutes because he has to get a little taller uh, before that happens i did not realize he grew i i totally messed that i thought he just woke up and he was big and he went to i don't know that's funny yeah he but grows a little bit more at the end yeah yeah <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, I liked all that. I did want to read one review just because it counteracts everything you said. <laughs> Great. <laughs> this one. So I'll read this. Is, this is the full one I'll read. Uh, I'm pulling a page from my film, some filth podcast. Rooney's 23 minute course in overacting a bonanza. That's mighty rich. Serling calling Rooney a runt, a small man. Rod is what? A whole half millimeter taller than Rooney. Are we to suspect that Rod may have projected some of his own small man complexes onto the character? An awful episode that is basically a rehash of Nervous Man in a $4 room and just as doll. Rooney hams it up all the way to 11. This performance may have served as a blueprint to kickstart the careers of infamous overactors John Travolta and Nick Cage. Weird what? synchronicity. I was watching Face Off yesterday. Even worse than Rooney's grimaces is the voice he provides for his sociopathic alter ego in which his overacting is appropriately mirrored with his overspeaking. The voice is full of lame, low-tier sarcasm. Pretty awful. So, um, yeah, that's that's what they said. They they have holes in the acting. I enjoyed it, but I enjoy a a, a, a man who knows how to scream in a room, screaming in a room. So if you think this is Mickey Rooney overacting, then you've never met Mickey Rooney. I'm sorry. Like, this is somebody who's always been boisterous and like energetic. And like, I don't see like this is his normal speaking voice. Like, <laughs> I just don't I don't see that. And to say that this like, yeah, this stuff, yeah whatever. Never mind. I mean, that's cool that's a cool story but um, i just think that, that this is the mark but Yes, differing opinions. Always interesting to hear. I don't know oh, maybe yeah. we maybe we should like ride that into your your earlier uh suggestion then. Well wait, I still had trivia. Oh, I'm, oh, yeah. I watch things with an inflation calculator now and uh that $8 that were left in his jeans is $82.30 in 2024. So that's that's something i can't help but look up every time that happens. They can go get a nice dinner if he wants. 
Yeah, one one dinner. And the line about how um, the alter ego said that he should just write a will and take gas. I was like, oh, <laughs> that, was, that, that was kind of a mean, like, oh, is that how it's done, I guess? I've never so, heard yeah. that expression either. Take gas. Uh, take gas, know. right? Okay, let's see. I, maybe I am done with the, the episode. Let me double check. Um, <laughs> that's port that he throws down, that bottle, right before he <laughs> smashes it. I was like, what is that port smash? That See, living smash? in Japan, I was worried for a minute because we don't wear shoes in our homes. I was like, oh, no, he's going to mm -hmm. he's gonna Bruce Willis, John McClane up his feet there, you know? <laughs> yeah, anytime <laughs> you throw to... a bottle, you're going to have to clean that up later. And the coffee he spilled, too, when he got startled by the, the second reflection, I think it was. Um, right. But I guess it's a pretty messy room, especially at the end when he's throwing things around. So it's really neatness is not a priority for him in his crisis. So I get it. Um, uh, here's a bit of kind of trivia on my end. Um, I didn't mention the music. It's just reused music, but they reused music from the episode, The Big Tall Wish. And I'm like, this episode should have been called The Big Tall Wish. <laughs> <laughs> that would have given it away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, uh... I think I'm done with episode trivia so let's see um I, I compared him to the boss baby a lot in my notes that's how i was feeling watching that last night but i haven't actually watched the movie the boss baby i just seen a clip or two so i i don't, I don't know if that's accurate or not i kind of see that though it makes a lot of sense i think it's like the bald head like event he didn't have, wasn't bald then but later i kind of kind of see it okay, well the boss baby mention... has hair a lot of the time too he's not always bald he grows <gasps> up a little bit i think oh mm. interesting um, okay, so back to wives. He had eight wives, nine children, two stepchildren, and 19 grandchildren, and then great grandchildren, but I didn't go that far. So um, I think we did mention Ava as his first wife. And what Ava said about him, one of many things probably, but she said that the night after their wedding night, he'd already woken up and was out playing golf. So I don't know if that gives any insight into why he had eight wives. Like maybe the relationship wasn't so much of a priority, but she also credits him with helping her to enjoy sex, which, you know, she had a very conservative North Carolina upbringing. And I thought that was kind of interesting that, you know, she's like, yeah, we had a great time. So, you know, that's kind of hard to picture, but it, that is something that she was very grateful to him for. And I think he had a quote about, you know, his wives and how he loved them all and he would have remarried them all and, and all that. So that's a very Mickey answer. So I'm, I'm looking at, <laughs> I'm looking at lengths of marriage here, mm -hmm. which is, uh, let's see, one year, that's Ava. Five years, two years, six years, eight, but it's a death. That's depressing. One mm -hmm. year, six years. And then he was married to Jane Chamberlain for 10, 20. Jane or 30, Jan? Jan, excuse me. 34 yeah. years, but then they separated two years before he died. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, then toward the end of his life was the, the accusations of elder abuse and fraud against one of his stepsons. So I don't think we should get too far into that, but that raised some awareness about what elder abuse is. And so I think it had something to do with that, their separation. But I did read that the relationship with Jan lasted longer than all the other wives put together. Combined, was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Can we go back to, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. okay, yeah, I got two more things. I got, so back to um, the Andy Rooney series, uh, or sorry, the Andy Rooney series, yep. Mm -hmm. Actually, I heard that was a mistake. Sometimes when people were reporting his obituary, they were getting him mixed up with Andy Rooney, which is I did odd. as a kid. I did as a kid. But both I mean, yeah. yeah, they both yell. They're both old, you know? I actually thought they were brothers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't believe that. That is that's really funny. But okay, my mistake, of course, Mickey. What the Andy Hardy series, like that was such a popular thing. It lasted for, you know, many, many episodes over years. And so um he had a great quote about that. Oh yeah, I guess MGM decided that was a huge asset to them. Like that series was very popular, very consistent. So this quote that Mickey had about it was, there was in fact a standard studio recipe. Take one young actress, pluck her eyebrows, cap her teeth, shape her hairline, pad as required, and throw her into the ring with Andy Hardy. Then wait and see if the public responded, the starlet became a star. And so that's such a studio system thing to do. But some of the people that he's talking about are Lana Turner, Catherine Grayson, Donna Reed, and Esther Williams. All of them had gotten a start at 
Harp won the Andy Hardy series. So I thought that was, um, and of course, Judy Garland was there. Gloria DeHaven was there as a pretty much a regular. But, um, and as for Judy, like they did eight films together, 10 technically, if you count some, some that are kind of guest starring, not, not centered on them entirely, but eight solid Garland Rooney pictures. And he could do everything. He could dance, he could sing, he could, you know, act, he could do, you know, silly things, comedy, drama. He really was a powerhouse. So the last thing I have is a recommendation. If you're interested in seeing a young Mickey Rooney, he was about 16. And this is a movie called The Devil is a Sissy from 1936. And it also has Jackie Cooper and Freddie Bartholomew. So the three biggest MGM male boy stars of the time. It kind of makes me wonder if when they did Grand Hotel and Dinner at Eight and Night Flight, they were like, let's have an all-star kids movie. And they took their three male boy assets and threw them together. So the IMDb summary is a well-bred English lad living in lower Manhattan tries to gain acceptance from his not so well-bred peers at school. And so it, it it's really bleak at times like the mickey rooney character his dad is on death row and i don't want to spoil anything so i won't mention how that turns out but it's not great and you know the the bonding between the ki- great supporting cast like just a really solid movie so if you want to see mickey rooney who looks exactly the same as a child but just you know just younger like that is a great one so black stallion devil's a sissy 40 some years apart but those are my two favorite films and I'm going to throw those recommendations out there. So good stuff. All right. I also used to get confused and think that he was playing one of the Hardy boys, but that's also not correct. (laughs) Right, (laughs) right. So many name (laughs) confusions with Rooney. I didn't actually, now I see the title, I guess I have heard of this before, but the last Andy Hardy film was made in 1958, 12 years after the previous one. And that's just weird. (laughs) I'm not sure how that plays out. Like, is he still himself or is it like, I I saw that there were later ones, but I didn't understand (laughs) if they were real. <laughs> that this, the, the 1958 one is real. It's uh, the tagline is Mickey and son together for the first time. Um, so they're trying. This is five years before this episode. And they're definitely either. He did a whole lot of aging in those five years or um, or the, I'm looking at a poster. It could just be some, you know, some um, well, not spray art um, airbrushing. Did they mm-hmm. airbrushed in the 50s? I don't know. <laughs> oh, they airbrushed in the 30s. Yeah, absolutely. That's how Joan Crawford never had freckles on her face. There we go. They okay. Airbrushed those negatives. But so, that is sad, actually, to, you know, 20 some years after it started to to try to dig it up again. That's, that's, that's sad. <laughs> Returning to his hometown of Carville after several years absence, Andrew Andy Hardy, now a high-flying West Coast lawyer, reminisces and flashbacks to earlier films about his past okay this sounds like crap it's a clip show <laughs> okay so it's not real it is like an homage it's an excuse to show the old stuff okay. it's a feature film but yeah it's showing clips from the old ones it sounds like uh with... is this mgm did mgm do this like mgm's collapsing under the weight of television and distributed by mgm production company fryman enterprises you can make yeah. of that what you will this um, is mgm trying to trying to use all its old glory <laughs> you know as it enters the 60s terrified so so my my, my first question then for this episode should be really fun um who in this episode went into the twilight zone <laughs> <laughs> i think i'm going to answer by saying his alter ego lives there yeah 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 I, maybe we all have to live in the twilight zone sure sure i guess i guess our our psyches do yeah, I guess I was joking about you know, like like it's one character, but uh, yeah, I guess there are two characters, so we get that. And whoever he's talking to on the phone, of course, we don't hear them, so they they don't count. Like his his ex girlfriend certainly had a weird ex- a weird phone call. I don't know if that's enough for a Twilight Zone experience, but. <laughs> and didn't he call like one of the? It was kind of vague. He called somebody that was like, "It's time for me to get my money." Like you know, I put in my work. So I guess the, whoever the corrupt person behind like some of their dealings he tried to call them to get the money yeah i think he was trying to, <laughs> to call it off the uh the the hustler the uh the bookie or something you know the mm-hmm. crooked bookie maybe that's that's what it was and Again, then he I, got hung up on but yeah i don't know if about sports or gambling i have bad luck in gambling so i don't gamble much <laughs> um but I mean, it's obvious. Grady is the only real character in this. Both sides of Grady, but uh, 
Does yeah. he deserve his trip into the Twilight Zone? Rod gives one of his like, this is an awful, terrible man prologue. So that that would suggest yes. The auto alter ego uh, also does quite a bit of uh, accusations towards him. Uh, yeah. So does he deserve it? I guess, do you deserve your own head telling you these things? That's, that's what Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys have been complaining about for the past 60 years. <laughs> oh, um, gosh, you know, I want to like it him because he's Mickey Rooney, but um, if he really did hurt, the, hurt these horses, then yeah, it looks like everyone agrees that he did deserve it, except the fans that signed the petition. Right. Well, yeah, the fans kind of don't weird. know. I guess they don't. Well, they should. It's on every newspaper that he had strewn about his bedroom, like six of them, like six different headlines. Well, some um, people don't care. I, 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 I okay, guess. let's let's think about uh, Pete Rose uh, was gambling and throwing out a baseball. Did people still like Pete Rose after that? Yeah, you're right. They did. They still do. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I, I, I guess the line is, I can't imagine anyone like going down the street, windows open, blasting R. Kelly anymore. That's probably not going to happen. <laughs> You make a really good point. <laughs> if that did happen, you'd be like, what are they doing? You know, if you, you know, people don't yeah. show their kids Jim will fix it anymore. You know, the, the so are you saying friend. that this jockey was canceled? Um, well, I guess once, once there's legal proceedings, though, that's past canceling, though. I mean, R. Kelly's past canceling, he's convicted, right? There's a difference. Well, yeah, I meant, <laughs> I just meant back to our, our jockey story. Yeah. <laughs> the public well, opinion. He doesn't seem that guess, hard canceled because he's had a petition to uh, reignite I mean, his career. I guess he does deserve it. I mean, I, it seems like he's very tormented. Like, he, he loves what he does, it seems, and he's trying so hard. He wants to be liked, and he wants to do a good job, and he, he really messed up that wish. He really botched that, <laughs> and now he's paying for it. So, you know, he's kind of hapless. Um, but and I next, guess he the thinks next he deserves it. Next should be for a really big horse, I guess. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> I hadn't considered. Oh, oh, thank you. There was one thing I forgot to say. He has the line. Sorry, I I faded out. He um he has the line that you don't you don't know me from Man of War, and I had to mention that even now, over a hundred years later, Man of War is considered one of the greatest race horses of all time, and he only ran for two seasons, nineteen nineteen and nineteen twenty, but. He ran 21 races and he won 20 of them. So he is still considered, that's a pretty unbeatable record. So without uh, so, <laughs> See, my brain's not wired for horse. You say Man of War. And then I immediately pops in my head that metal album from the early oh. 80s with a bunch of big greased buff dudes on the cover. <laughs> I thought the you were going to say that. The like the jellyfish. I thought you were oh, gonna... oh, that also no, no, that came to mind second. First was okay. the uh, <laughs> early eighties, uh, very cheesy metal album covers of Man of War. Which, if you don't know those, look them up. They're pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's go ahead and place this one on the tripometer. Zero is not trippy. Um, five is very trippy. Where would you like to place it? I've forgotten really how I've gauged everything else, so I'm just gonna randomly say. I'm going to say four because it's irreversible. It wasn't, you know, I guess a lot of things are irreversible in the Twilight Zone, but I'm going to, okay, let me rethink it. I'm going to put it at a 3.2. Sure. <laughs> Although, I don't know, maybe it's another wish later. We, we, we're we not sure. I mean, the second one was a freebie, right? He didn't wish to be even two feet higher. Yeah, that I missed. I missed. And, and, and the, it's his... In the Blu-ray, you can see it because in the background, there's a door. And then the first time you can see the door with some space where the, you know, they cut out or something. And then it gets even smaller. There's like a shadow of the original door each time. So I would want them to imply that he's growing continuously. That would be really interesting. Like he just grows and grows until he, I don't know, stretches out. Like the talk I, of the fifth different woman. Different <laughs> twist. <sighs> He's not yeah. a woman, but that's a movie, so I have to cite it correctly. And it was his own mind that was able to do this to him. That's pretty. That's pretty freaky. Like, yeah, was it own... really his mind, or was it? You know, I always think there are demons and all these things. <laughs> so, but something had the power to do that. Like he wakes up from his nap. Like you know, it's just his mind that did that. I don't know. I don't know. Well, there's th this one is definitely a supernatural one. We've had a few recently where we're like, oh, there's nothing supernatural here, like steel, nothing supernatural there. It's just robots. But uh, yeah. yeah, this one, eh, this one's supernatural. Where is it coming from? Not sure. 
Uh, on the tripometer, after watching the episode, I was willing to give it a three because uh, a man screaming on himself is weird. There's all the weird reflective shots. So three seemed reasonable. After listening to commentary track, uh, up to 3.5. <laughs> <laughs> I love the reflective stuff. That was so cool. It was such a great you know, mechanism for him to not be able to get away from himself. Like he smashes the mirror and thinks it's done. Like that torment that just builds. I love that. I thought yes. that, I, I don't know. I love it. Yeah, it seemed like he was like living out titles from the Who's Tommy, you know, go to the mirror boy, <laughs> smash the mirror, you know. <laughs> That's how I read it, at least. Naturally. <laughs> um, I, I know you finished a trivia sheet, but did you have any final thoughts on this one? On this episode specifically or Mickey Rooney specifically? Uh, in general, I mean, we've been talking both. I mean, well, one of the reasons I invited you is because just talking about the episode, I mean, there's not, with one actor, there's not that much meat to the bone of just talking about the episode, but uh, either way is fine. <laughs> uh, did I mention that he wrote two books? I don't think I did that. I don't he believe actually you was, damn, I gotta take better notes or like scratch out my notes better. Um, he wrote two books. One was called Life is Too Short in 1991. Oh, and the oh, second, oh. <laughs> the second is called The Search for Sunny Skies, but it's spelled S-O-N-N-Y. So it's a person's name, a novel, um, 1994. So that's kind of fun. I don't know. I, you know, Mickey Rooney is kind of a legend. Like he, he is a lot. He's a lot. Like there's a lot to him there. And, and just, he's such an important part of film history. And, you know, if you only know a little part of him, then it's fun to get to know the other parts of him. So yeah. it was, this yeah. is a nice kind of in between, but you can go way back. You can go way ahead in time from where we are in 1963 and find some really good content. And he's a, a very unique person. Like they're, they're really, you know, I guess everyone is, but you know, that's a, it's a pretty distinctive character and to have the longevity that he did is a really special thing. So I think that's that it was delightful to watch him in this. I thought it was a fun story and, um, and he was doing wh who he is. Like that's, you know, I understand the criticisms if you don't know who you're getting into, but that's, that's, that's Mickey Rooney. Like it's a, it's a great example of who he is and who he can be. Yeah, I'm saying, I guess I guess this is the Twilight Zone's biggest star catch because I mean you got folks that were not famous yet like you know Robert Redford or uh, Robert Duvall, uh, we had Dennis Hopper recently, but they weren't famous when they did this, right? Uh, Buster mm -hmm. Keaton, I mean I, I love Buster Keaton, and in my mind he's more famous, but I don't think he's actually more famous than Mickey Rooney. <laughs> Uh, maybe at the time, I, and then he ebbed and flowed too with his, you know, people, his people's awareness of him, whereas Mickey Rooney was kind of steady, I think. So I don't know. That's a tough call. I think in retrospect, people know Buster Keaton better, but it's hard to, I, how can I know? I don't know what other people know. That's, it's hard to be in touch with what the average person does know. Although I remember I was at work, uh, working in, um, 20, what year is that? 2013 or something. I had a coworker and we were talking about movies and Mickey Rooney is the person she said she liked. This like 20 year old kid was like, yeah, I like Mickey Rooney. I'm like, Mickey Rooney, Mickey Rooney. Like, <laughs> are we talking about this day one? And she thought he was really cool. And I don't remember why it was just, you know, you never know what, who reaches people. And especially now when you can access all of film history simultaneously, like it'd be interesting to see how people respond to him. Like, you know, decades down the road if he's still such an important figure or just one of many in, in a longer history yeah f feel feel free to disagree with this statement but i do feel like you can kind of pour over keaton's uh filmography more like really like dive into that and study it whereas rooney's probably going to be a little thinner of a ice on the top there <laughs> he's sort of all over the place i mean he definitely has more eras though i think that you know oh yeah for sure uh, so you really can pick and choose and see. I, I love the Devils and Sissy so much. That really, I love the Black Stallion. I guess I can't really choose between the two of them. But to see that range, to see 16-year-old him and then uh, 79 minus 20. So, you know, roughly 60 over there. Just, just uh, I don't know. I love seeing long careers like that. That's why I love film history. I love I love to see these these stories unfold. And there's something very powerful about being at a place in time long after to be able to see the whole story at once. So it's just it was a fun episode. I'm glad you invited me. Thank you. You are welcome. Uh, did you have anything you want to plug other than those two Rooney movies? No, I'm going to focus just on those. Okay, <laughs> They're sure. both great. Watch them. <laughs> Double feature them. Then you don't have to choose. Uh, <laughs> As for us, we're Time Enough Podcast. You can support us 
on Patreon at Podcastio. Podcastius, where we do lots of podcasts. I mentioned films and filth a few times where you look at what IMDb calls really good and really bad movies. And, uh, you know, that's not always as clear as it might seem. <laughs> space, uh, we were covering Space 1999 on Podcast 1999. We actually just finished that and uh, we'll move on to doing apes we're still calling it podcast 1999 though if you're going to do 70s sci-fi tv shows you can keep using that name i think it's fine. <laughs> and uh there's some video game stuff like luke loves pokemon the game game show and monster mash i believe is coming back soon for the monster hunter fan okay that's it what do i how do i end this one do i s smash my laptop screen are you going to start like showing up in other reflections or something <laughs> you could do like a bottle shattering um like sound effect you know because of the zoom filters, I'd have to add that in because if I go, you probably didn't hear anything. Oh no, just get a get one. Like just get I'll smash like, a bottle in my it. room. Except I wear socks, so I don't do that. Right. Just get the sound effect. It's much easier. <laughs> okay, that's a cut spot. Okay, thank you. What are you cool. up next for? I know is it the Queen of the Nile or Queen of the Nile the and the masks were yeah, those were two on there. I don't know if there was anything other than the mask is like a like an all-star event right like, like I didn't I'm, do that very much. yeah so i'm gonna invite four wants... people I, i'm gonna request like mardi gras mask so you don't want to cover your mouth for that right uh right <laughs> so like mardi gras know. mask and then i won't introduce anybody but it'll be all people that have been on the show before <laughs> so so we'll, but nobody will see our mask right it's just for each other yeah basically <laughs> okay. we could like describe each other's masks we, we can, yeah that's why that's why i'm like they could be like mardi gras masks or just like you know the general product is, yeah it's just for the ambiance really <laughs> i'm excited i think queen of nile is before that though mm. oh yeah queen of nile is first you are correct okay so I'll be back. And that's Anne Blythe, I think. So I'll be back with more MGM stuff. Excellent. Okay, cool. I, I don't know anything about Queen of the Nile. So that'll, I'll be running into that one as a, I mean, I didn't know anything about this episode. I just like starring Mickey Rooney, no one else. Well, I need to get. <laughs> <laughs> there, I there. wish I had more recollection of the other episode. Like maybe those criticisms of it being too much like that one is fair, but seeing this completely without any other context, like, I don't know. I just, yeah. I just yeah. love that kind of psychological like, stuff. Who was in that? Let me see who was in the other episode. Uh, it's a guy who has been in the Twilight Zone multiple times, but it's like a character actor, so it's not. Um... Did we mention that this was the only time Mickey Rooney was in a Twilight Zone episode? You probably did. Oh, I don't know if I said that directly, but I think everybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. I think my they ca the is this the biggest star they caught? You know, eh, they might not catch him twice. Uh, Nervous Man and for Joe Mantell was the guy in there. Do I even know who that is? Joe he was he was nominated for Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for his role as best friend Angie in the nineteen ninety film fifty five film Marty. Okay, so that makes me think of Ernest Borgnine, and I did not mention this because I couldn't tell if this was a fake feud or not, but I read that they that Mickey Rooney and Ernest Borgnine had a feud, and this is apparently Mickey Rooney's quote. He said. All the Oscars in the world can't buy him dignity, class, and talent. I don't know why he's famous and why he's a star. Talk about a lucky jerk. But then I also read that maybe it was like a pretend feud. like a, Talk about a lucky know, jerk. Fred Allen, yeah. So, <laughs> they did both show up on The Simpsons. <laughs> I think they're both in It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, too. Uh, oh, here we go. Mantel, the, the $4, uh, the $4. Nervous Man Four Dollar Room. Uh, Mantella, a small but pivotal role in the gas station scene of Alfred Hitchcock's 1963 film *The Birds*. In the 1974 film *Chinatown*, he played Lawrence Walsh, associate of Private Eye Jake. Get, how do you say his name? And delivered the fa film's famous last line: "Forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown." So he's that guy. I thought it was what was um, Houston who said that, but I guess he didn't. He was the f other guy. I mean, he's he was walking away right at that point. Mm -hmm. It's been a little while since I watched it, but. I, yeah. Anyway, okay. uh, uh, that's, you know, Wiki's not always correct, but that's what it says. <laughs> that's a cool tidbit. All right. Yeah, I wouldn't have remembered him, but I, I recognize what you're saying. So. And here's a picture of him on Wiki pointing a gun at Orson Bean, who is uh, dressed in, in, in fake Asian uh, stuff. <laughs> fake Asian? <laughs> like 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 um, like um Rooney and Breakfast at Tiffany's, except oh, this time yeah. it's Orson Bean. 
I'm glad that you skipped that. It was funny because when you said like that we weren't going to talk about it, I thought that was like an internal note. <laughs> no, 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 no. The joke is that I said that, but then we but don't talk about it. I Got said it. it, but we don't have to talk because people will be like, well, why didn't they mention it? Maybe, you know, so we did uh, mention yeah. it, but then we proceeded not to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole other, it's a whole other thing. So but, it's, uh, that, that would really bring the episode down. Like there's, yes. there's more to talk about. That's just one thing. Yes, so. yes, yes, yes. Um, and again, I, I couldn't talk about it anyway. I've never seen the movie. So <laughs> right. Good out. <laughs> Good out. <laughs> <laughs> okay i will catch you later then i'm going to stop recording goodbye to patreon folks